Hello, I'm Angela Gutches, and on behalf of my co-organizer, Sarah Gaither, we welcome you to the special symposium, Seeing Race in Cognitive Psychology. Because the study of race is not a topic that is typically well represented at Psychonomics, we thank the Society and Dwayne Watson in particular for including a session on this topic this year. We're particularly grateful to the speakers who agreed to share the research with us today because they're not typical psychonomes. Please do submit your questions for the Q&A at the end of the session and the other speakers will join us then. See you then. It is such a pleasure for me to be here um, in a session um, at Psychonomics that I think might be unique in Psychonomics's entire history since the organization began to have uh, its meetings uh, around 1960. Uh, and so for that reason, of course, I'm um, really honored to be part, part of it. Um, let's just start with our uh, thinking about the field of cognitive psychology. And I would say that um, uh, this most venerable of areas within um, psychology has used the physical world as its playground. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that no matter who you are, uh, uh, the typical cognitive psychologist, let's say the psychologist who's studying attention might use, you know, little little squares and dots to get people to attend to one piece and to see what happens uh, in the surround and so on. If you are somebody who studies perception, you might look at um, drawings of physical objects in the world or even more complex scenes, you know, of a city with buildings and roads and cars moving around and so on. The standard slide that everybody who studies perception always starts their talk with about the complexity of um, the world out there. And then, of course, they're making a very important point about how is it that we might represent that uh, on this little thin uh, film called the retina. Um, and if you're interested in memory, you might uh, have people study, you know, lists of, of, of words um, and then test them on that, or at least classically, that is uh, what we did. Uh, and if we're interested in learning, we want to create, you know, a sort of simple situation in which uh, whether it's a, a rat running through a maze or whether it is um, a, a human, uh, we're looking at, you know, the trajectory of, you know, learning and, and, and how we store what we've learned, how we forget what we've learned and so on. And the playground, the, the stimuli that are the basis of almost all of our theories about, um, about um, um, the mind. Uh, are theories that have been derived from studying how people deal with the physical world. Um, but there is something interesting about that because to humans, what seems to be the most important thing in their universe, the most consequential things that happen in their universe happen because of other people, right? Our conspecifics, uh, but not only they as individuals, but groups of them. Uh, groups of people who have meaning for us in some way. And so it is a little bit odd, if you will, or interesting, that the bread and butter work of cognitive psychology has set that aside as something that should be done by some other group of people because they're going to bring their knowledge that is, you know, incredibly important about attention and perception and learning and memory and reasoning and language and so on to to look at you know these the in, in many in many cases just sort of the physical um, world so I'm gonna argue that there might be good reason for a cognitive psychologist to expand that out a little bit and why why should they do that it's good for their theories okay it's good because there are data that might come when you look at uh, how people think about the most important objects in their universe um, that might expand the generality of existing theories. It might also place constraints on those theories. And as my time at the Santa Fe Institute has taught me, when you study uh, complex systems, there are emergent properties. There are emergent properties that come out that simply would not be available um, in the simpler cons uh, con constituent parts. So for all of those reasons, we might study them, but then of course there is um, learning about the default mode network, okay? The work done by um, Rakel and colleagues, which was sort of interesting at the time when it came out. What does the human mind do when it is told to do nothing? Uh, just do whatever you wanna do. Usually a psychologist will give people a task to do, and that's what you measure when you're imaging the brain. 
But if you tell them not to do anything, what is it that's active? And it turns out that there is not only a, a network of regions that become active, but that those net, that network of regions that consist mainly of things like the medial PFC and both medial and lateral parts of parietal and temporal cortices, that that activity seems to consume most of the brain's energy, 90% and above. Okay? Everything else is frou-frou. Okay? So what's so interesting about this, 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 this network that is active when we're doing nothing? And in parallel, there have been discoveries that show that when you tell people to mentalize, when you tell people to think about another person's mind, when you do self-referential thinking, me, you, us, them, and so on, that there are a set of net, uh, there's a set of uh, a network of, of of regions in the brain that become active, and lo and behold, they seem to map on to the default mode network. The same thing you're doing when you're doing nothing. I'm going to just use this to say, when you tell people to do nothing, what they are doing by default is social cognition. That's why we should care about this. And today, we're going to. Um, talk about race, but um, of course, if you want to talk about race, you have to begin with Helmholtz, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the remarkable person um, um, who, who taught us so many things, both in, in, in physics and, and physiology and so on. But I would say for me personally, the greatest contribution from Helmholtz was his um, two-word phrase, unconscious inference. And the idea is very simple. There's a complex world out there. How do we represent it given our simple sensory and, and mental capacities? Well, of course, we do it unconsciously. We can't be consciously doing all of it. Uh, we see something and, and that's, you don't have a choice about whether to see it or not. You see it the way it appears to you. But then the word inference there to make sure that we're not thinking that it's an accurate representation of reality as it is. So we're doing it without awareness and it's not accurate, right? It's some representation. Um, and that's that's sort of that psychology's sort of single most powerful concept uh, that we have given uh, to uh, the world, to and anybody else outside of the field. And it's that concept of mental um, representation. And the simplest uh, example of it that Helmholtz gave us is, you know, it's the, it's the, it's how the, how the, how the world rotates and, uh, and revolves and, and how we see it. I mean, you and I know, uh, every fourth grader knows that it is the sun that is constant and the earth that rotates and revolves. But every morning when you sit out there and watch the sun rise to your brain and it is the sun that is rising. It is not you who are moving. And I think that that is going to be our metaphor. And it's so simple. Any fourth grader can tell you that we ought to be able to uh, get through this talk. Okay. All right. Um, personal story, uh, reading a paper by a wonderful cognitive psychologist by the name of Dan Levin. And Dan had published this figure. He was interested in brightness perception. And in his paper, um, there was this, this, this image that you're seeing now. And under the image was a note. And the note said that, you know, he had held the brightness of the faces to be constant um, and had, um, you know, varied the features and so on. But the brightness of the faces was constant. And I, caring about Dan's career, uh, wrote an email immediately to tell him that the journal had published the wrong note with the, with the figure or the wrong figure with the, with the note, uh, because obviously he had varied the skin tone um, uh, of, of these faces. And Dan being nice Dan, he didn't tell me, you're wrong, Mazarin. He said, um, he just sent me a Photoshop file <laughs> so that I could see that the skin tone on every face is identical, okay? Um, that led to a paper that he and I wrote in which we did something to, to test this, what we would call, I guess, uh, cognitive or higher order penetration of perception. Does your knowledge of the race of the face affect something like your perception of the color of the skin of the face? And sure enough, uh, the data show that if you give people a reference face, like the face on the left, and then give them a critical face, that is the, the, the stimulus on the right, and you tell them to use a knob to get the two to be equal in skin tone, the underlying brightness will be actually significantly different from each other. Um, telling us that indeed there is this, this going on. Now, you know, I think this this kind of study should change people's minds on whether there is cognitive penetration of perception or not. There are people who 
still believe that there isn't. But I would say that they believe that because of the stimuli they use, and that if they were starting, to, if they had, if they start to use these, I don't, know, I don't want to call them more complex. They're just different. They're these social things that are in our environment. If you start to use those, your theories might be different. The threats to your theories um, might be more easily visible to you. So, so this is one of the reasons why we must do it. But now let's move into slightly different territory with me reminding us, along with our favorite statistician, William Deming, um, that of course, you know, in God we, we should trust, but everybody else should please bring some data. And so these data are actually quite important. They're important not because any one study is Five thousand cross social grouping, like their sexuality or their age um, or their gender um, uh, or their race and ethnicity or their language and culture and accents and so on. And you can vary those, right? You can pick two people, one male, one female, one light-skinned, one dark-skinned, somebody who's gay, somebody who's straight, somebody who's elderly, somebody who's young. And you can now present those people with the same piece of evidence attached to them, the same housing application, the same bank loan application, the same resume, um, you know, the, the, um, the same um, argument being made in a classroom uh, if you're interested in education, uh, the same behavior of reaching for your wallet in, uh, to show to a police officer. Uh, presenting the same x-ray or CAT scan to a doctor. So these are held constant. It's the same CAT scan. It's the same report of pain, of, of pain. How much pain are you in? And two people can say, I'm a five on a seven point scale. And another person might say, I too, I'm a five on a seven point scale. Does the doctor's prescription of pain medication differ? And the data show, yes, it does. If you're African-American, for reporting exactly the same level of pain, you will be prescribed lower amounts of painkillers in every disease that's been studied and in every region of this country. Okay? Um, I won't go into the details because there are 5,000 of them. You can go read them. You know, they're uh, resume studies. What's the likelihood a black man will get a job in New York City? Well, the same as that of a white man uh, applying for the same job with the same resume, but on whose resume there is one additional line that says, I am a felon. I was convicted. I've served my time. Now, in the mind of the hiring manager, that is to say you, and me, these two people look roughly the same to us. And now we say it's a toss up. And I don't think these people are doing it because they care to have felons re-enter the job market. To them, the two people now look similar because they think they have equal worth, okay? And, 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 um, and so on. So this is true. Okay? There is there is very little. I mean, you, you, you can, if you want to be a doubter, you can, but you'll you'll be out of touch with reality because just looking at disparities in healthcare treatment can can you know reach a ceiling if you just stack up all the papers. That's just one variable, race, and one domain, healthcare. But you can. Um, so so this, in that sense, is the single most important slide today, because if you know this and if you recognize that this is the case, how can you not ask as a psychologist, as a cognitive psychologist? What is it that's going on in a person's head when good people with not a shred of what we would call race bias or racism um, um, are, are doing um, are doing this? How can how can this this fantastic doctor uh, be saying, you know what? I think that this black person deserves less painkiller. That is not what's going on. Something else is making them feel that they should be giving less medication uh, to relieve the pain of that person. Now. Social psychologists have come up with some reasons for why this might happen. There are, you know, reasonable, there's, a re, there's reasonable evidence when you look at two resumes, male and female, and you see them to be different, that really what's going on is that people are reporting seeing greater competence in the, but that's not going too far from, from what the data actually say. That's, of course, competence is going to be involved because that's what you're basing your decision on. This is why we need cognitive psychology, right? We need cognitive psychology because we must now look at every aspect of attention and perception and learning and memory and reasoning and inference formation and so on in order to figure out what is mediating this, right? You've got the data out there. Two people are identical. Judgments of them are not identical. And this is happening everywhere and in all sorts of domains. We've got to figure out what's going on and we don't have an answer today that is at least satisfying to me. 
And this is why I think we need uh, to bring to bear the strongest theories that we have. We'll give you a quick example of, an, of a study that we did a long time ago. The, uh, it, it came about because I was struck by my own belief in what was being reported in the New York Times uh, about this man called Wen Ho Lee, a nuclear scientist who was being accused of having uh, sold American nuclear secrets to the Chinese government. And what made this case so interesting uh, to me is that um, uh, he was eventually found to be not guilty. Um, and the, the list of, you know, what he was being indicted on was long, you know, 59 of them. And so how did that happen was the question. And we went to the lab and we did a simple study to say, is it possible that if you're Asian American, that you're not really American? Um, and indeed, our study showed a simple association between European Americans and American uh, to be relatively much stronger than the relationship between American and Asian American. But remember, this study is interesting because we're not asking people for their preferences. Who do you like more? Who do you like less? We might say, yeah, my culture. But in this case, we're actually telling them that these people are all American, equally American. Right? And now when the data show that one group is more easily associated to these symbols on the left, uh, 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 even, even though both groups are should be associated equally with the symbols on the left, uh, these other symbols on the right are just, you know, uh, mo mostly sort of fakish uh, symbols. They're just to capture the category foreign. That's Luxembourg turned around 90 degrees. Or and, and, and that, I think, was, was the revealing um, result. I'm just going to give it to you in raw latencies, even though we wouldn't uh, easily do that anymore in the paper. But um, here we go. Uh, you'll see that it's like you know, more than 200 millisecond difference. You're faster to associate European Americans with, the, with, the, with symbols of America than Asian Americans, equally American, but not associated with them. But here is the, the, the kicker study. Let's make it easy for people to not show this bias. Let's pick, you know, European um, well-known people um, in the 19, late 1990s. These were people who were quite well-known. Hugh Grant, the British actor, still well-known. Gerard Depardieu, the French actor, uh, also well-known, versus people like Connie Chung and Lucy Liu and, and so on, who were Asian and American. Okay? Now it should be a no-brainer, as a cognitive neuroscientist would say. Now it's a no-brainer because the, because the people who are white are European, the people who are Asian uh, are American. And yet the data continue to show that disparity that in our minds, there is a particular kind of person who is American and a particular kind of American who is not American. Okay? And now we can go back and do tests of Native Americans with uh, compared to Europeans and so on and look at, look at that. So the reason this test is of interest is because it is not just a deviation from some values that we might have, it's a deviation from accuracy. It is not accurate. This, this response is an inaccurate response. And then of course we can ask lots of questions today about whether in the moment of this pandemic, um, how, much, how much bearing does this, this have to do? How, how much bearing does this have on, on things like um, the reports that Asian Americans are, are offering, the, the counting of hate crimes against Asian Americans that have been um, on the rise in, in quite significantly and, and, and what it means when you're walking in a grocery store as an Asian American and somebody says to you to go back where you came from and you're living in Cambridge and you think, uh, where should I go back to, to San Diego where I was born? Um, so for all of these reasons, I believe that we need to know what these representations of race are to have a more accurate understanding of what is in our minds. What is common to all of the results from the IAT, of course, is the classic dissociation between what we say on the one hand, what we know to be right and true on the one hand, and then what our behavior uh, seems to be or what some other part of our mind seems to be. And I just, just want to tell you that I think that, that, that this should appeal because um, it, it is a, it is, it is, it is a, a form of, of um, inaccuracy, right? And that is to say, think about, I mean, I, I often use Lincoln uh, as, as, as the model, right? There is Abraham Lincoln, um, the great emancipator, um, the person who many people regard to be the greatest of all American presidents and so on. Um, and yes, on the one hand, you have Lincoln who did what many might arguably was the hardest thing to do in this country, and that is to have two sides of this country go to war with each other to resolve something important, and that was um, the emancipation 
of, 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 of African um, uh, slaves who had been brought to this country. Now, but remember something that you may not know about Lincoln, and that is that while he was the great emancipator, he really believed that you know, African Americans um, could not only never be in the same physical space as white Americans, he said, they will never ever work together. They will not work together, let alone things like marry or be friends. But he very seriously considered taking freed slaves and shipping them all to Liberia. Okay? So these are both sides of Lincoln. And they're not in two different minds. And I'm going to argue that that is something we need to contend with. And as cognitive psychologists, you should get very deeply intrigued by the fact that a single mind can hold these two very different thoughts and views. One positive, one negative, one that says, you know, X is good, the other that might say Y is good. All of that is worth thinking about. Uh, and race is one place where all of this comes to light in such a stark way. Why do we study college students in this regard? I mean, we should study them even more than we do. I would argue that they're not, for us, a sample of convenience. They are the sample of interest because college students tend to be liberal. Uh, and if we can show that in the minds of these very people whose conscious values read beautifully like the constitutions of countries, and yet if we can show that in their minds too, these associations exist, not because they chose them, but because they're carriers of the thumbprint of the culture, that then we will think very differently about everything. Uh, I'm going to tell you, oh, excuse me for a second, I'm going to tell you about a study by um, by Keith Payne, which is in a family of studies that have been co coming out recently that are quite exciting. These studies have a certain pattern, right? They take the IAT data from you know, the millions of people that we've collected and put online in the public, in the public domain so anybody can use them. They take the IAT data, let's just pick race as an example, and what they do is that they make little markings in the country by counties, by states, by metropolitan area, whatever, and within that area, they take all the scores of all the individuals from that area, that geographic area who've taken the IAT race test, and they lump them all together and they come up with an average score for that place. Then they uh, rank them all from lowest to highest, and then they look to see what else it will predict. And there are studies these days that you can look at on how this bias might predict upward mobility, uh, lethal use of force by police, health outcomes, and so on. And these studies are incredibly interesting, right? Because they cut out a lot of the error variants uh, in individual measurement. And once you take a look at them um, at this more aggregate level, you're able to see that they are predicting all sorts of things. I'll pick the one by Keith Payne because I think to people who care about learning, uh, who are interested in, in, in learning, uh, that this, this discovery might really require us to expand out what learning means, how long it might last, and, and, and how it, it comes to happen. Um, and here's the study by Payne. So just tuck it away in the back of your mind if you're a learning theorist, and, and then think about it, because you will have much to say about it that's of interest, uh, much more than uh, somebody like me uh, might be able to do. And so this is really an invitation to cognitive psychologists to, to join with us in, in trying to answer these hard questions about how this comes to be. So here is the beautiful study. Um, so in Payne's research, he goes to the southern states to 1860, and he looks and marks out all these little areas. And for each area, he identifies what's the proportion of enslaved people to people who are not enslaved, okay? Um, and then makes his, his variable, which is a list um, of places ranking from, let's say, um, the, the, the place that has the highest proportion of enslaved uh, to, uh, people to non-enslaved people all the way down to the lowest. And then he goes to the data from the race IAT collected in the last, you know, whatever, 15 years or so. And, and he correlates the two and he reports that the greater the proportion of enslaved people in a particular region of the South in 1860, the greater is the anti-Black bias there today. Now, the reason this should stun you, um, in addition to, of course, both, both Keith and I would say that this is to us sort of evidence of what we might mean when we say systemic racism. Um, but I want you to just pause for a second to think about how unusual it is to even see such a relationship, right? The likelihood that you would take a score from today and be able to map it 
to something from 1860 itself should be stunning. But remember, so it's because it's not the same people right, anymore. But think about what's happened to the South, right? The amount of movement, right? The amount of people from there who left and other people who are there today and people who are there today because they must work for Google, so they must be there, not because they're choosing to be there, but because they ended up there, okay? In spite of all of that, if you see a correlation, what it's got to mean is that no matter who you are, once you go there, you become a person of that place because you drink the water and you breathe the air and you see the statues on your street and your children are learning certain things in school, that gets into you and that gets into your head because without that, you can't see such a relationship. So I give this to you because I think it can just give us lots of thoughts about not only how critical learning is, but all the ways in which it might happen implicitly, uh, whether you want it to or not, just because you moved into a county that in 1860 had a certain number of enslaved people to free people. We're doing some work these days um, that is built actually on the work of Phil Goff, who is in this symposium, um, in looking at, you could call it dehumanization, but it really is to look at the association in our minds between different types of human groups. They're all human. So there's no question that they're all human. There are no animal groups here. But do we associate all humans equally with human and animal is the question. And uh, Kirsten Morehouse and Keith Maddox are my colleagues uh, on this work. And um, Kirsten's uh, studies have been showing us something that is kind of striking. Um, these are IAT data. If the dot was on the dotted line, if the, if the data were on the dotted line, it would mean that you associate groups like black and white, Hispanic and white, Asian and white, those are the three tests on the x-axis, equally with human and animal. And both groups are human, black people are human, white people are human, Hispanic, Asians are all human, we know that. Um, and so the data that we should have seen should have shown that all three dots sit perfectly on this line, but they do not. And they do not because what we're seeing here, the below the line data, say that there is a greater association of black with animal, Hispanic with animal, Asian with animal relative to white. And by the way, if you're curious, we've 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 categorized animal in a variety of different ways. There is no way we that that remains to be tested. We've done it with farm animals and with pets and with bad ick, icky animals and so on. And it does not matter. It's the category animal that uh, is easier for us to put together with black, with Hispanic, and with Asian. And that too may surprise you because you may have expected that this would happen with, with black because there are actual stereotypes that we can see in our language and in pictures and so on, especially in Phil's work where he showed that black is associated to ape more than to big cats, which relatively is more associated with white. Um, but here you're seeing it not just for black and white, but for any group that is um, not the dominant group. I think, again, these data that tell us that there are these kinds of associations ought to be of great interest to anybody who wants to study the mind, because here are two deviations, deviation from accuracy and a deviation from one's values and the effect sizes. The top one is Cohen's D. They're non-trivial, okay? So when I... Um, in, in sort of, I'm bringing us to a close. Um, you know, for me, one of the great um, psychologists of our time was Roger Shepard, um, um, known for many, many, many things. But uh, who can who can who can stay away from his beautiful drawings in his book Mind Sights, in which he says about the table illusion. So, as you know, yeah, any student of psychology knows this: that the surface the surface of the table on the left and the table on the right are identical um, in shape and size, and they won't seem that way to us. And we know what causes the illusion and so on. So, I won't go into that today, other than to say that he said any knowledge or understanding we may gain of this illusion, we may gain at the intellectual level, remains virtually powerless to diminish the magnitude of the illusion. Right? That's what I want us to confront today. Because if we truly confront this, many things in the world would change. If we believe that these, the unconscious inference that Helmholtz spoke about is real, then how we design practices uh, of who we hire in our departments, which students we think belong, who actually has talent, 
all of this, everything has to be questioned, including whether you should be interviewing at all uh, when you make your uh, decisions. And I'm just going to say that if we start to use race, ethnicity, and many other social categories and integrate them into our theories of and, and, and research on perception and attention, learning and memory, on and on and on, it will invite us to grab onto even newer concepts that have currently been kept out of cognitive psychology. Today, if a candidate studies moral cognition, uh, he can be hired in the Department of Psychology, but not in cognitive psychology. He has to find, we have to find some other place uh, for them, even though what they're studying is nothing other than how the human mind uh, is engaging um, uh, with these very fundamental uh, ways of representing um, the world. So do not, please do not bring into cognitive psychology the study of race in order to be fashionable and talk about diversity and inclusion and so on. Okay? Do it because if you don't, it is at your own peril. Um, do it because it is necessary for a complete and accurate view of the human mind because it will challenge your theories because you may give up the belief that, that there isn't any cognitive penetration or perception. Um, if we don't, then the empirical landscape of cognitive psychology today will seem to future generations that look at us today just about as accurate as this image was, uh, that this image seems to us today of America. In the 1950s, this was an, a, a common view uh, amongst Americans and people outside America of the country. But you and I know that this was not a true view of America, that this was one view of America, okay? And that it's the, for the same reason that I think that we ought to be thinking differently today uh, about what we choose to study and how we choose to study it. And please try to make all these area boundaries be gone, okay? Because there's no reason why the study of race has to be uh, uh, put into some little category of one kind of area um, of psychology. And if we do that, then I'm going to just say that I believe that we will not have a more, we will, we will not have a perfect view of our minds, but we will have a more perfect view of, of our minds. Thank you. All righty. So let me talk a little bit about race and policing um, and how social psychology, I think, um, uh, and social cognition within that can start fixing what's broken. Um, and to tell you that story, I want to start a little bit with a story about how I got into this, which was the year I went to grad school. Some different things were going on in social psychology and social cognition. So I went to grad school in 1999. Um, it was a great year. It was a great song. Um, it was also the year, though, that Amadou Diallo was shot 41 times. NYPD officers shot at him 41 times. Not necessarily even an unusual shooting in most cases. It's just that 41 times seems like a lot for someone who was unarmed. Amadou Diallo, for those of you who don't remember the incident, um, was pulling out his wallet to identify himself. And officers, you know, they, they claimed that they all saw a gun. Now, if you're a social psychologist, there's this ironic feeling of, of thrill um, of uh, opportunity to be helpful. Because this is the kind of cognitive error, visual error, that social cognition can help with. Um, so this set off a different era in the study of implicit bias um, and social cognition and perception, uh, uh, a portion that I was uh, a part of and proudly. But I think it's useful to note that we're not close to 1999 anymore. I had hair back then. Um, and the year I went on sabbatical after taking tenure in 2014, there was another critical incident that captured the minds of people in the country. Michael Brown Jr. was shot and killed. The rallying cry was, hands up, don't shoot. And in response to this, there was the question that came to me pretty frequently. Does psychology have anything to say about it? Is it even possible that the work that we do in the laboratories or even in the fields could do anything to make it better? I, when, I, when I think and thought about that in 2014, I hearken back to uh, work I was doing at the very beginning of the founding of the center I run, the Center for Policing Equity, um, where I spoke to a police chief who said something that kind of stunned me. He said, if policing is supposed to uh, protect people, that American policing has been profoundly broken in black communities for generations. And it stunned me not because uh, of it being a trenchant truth or being particularly poetic, though it's a, a fine for turn of phrase. It stunned me because of who said it. 
It was the acting chief of police in Salt Lake City, Chris Burbank. He's retired now. He actually works at the center. Um, but the thought was that the chief of Salt Lake City knows this well enough to say it back in 2008, then surely there must be something that social psychologists can do to help fix this thing that's so, so broken. So the goal of, the talk, of my talk today will be providing a social psychological framework for racism and policing. To test that framework, um, I'm going to show you, I think, two studies, and I've got the time to do that. Um, and to demonstrate the framework's utility. I'm going to do that in a couple of parts. In part one, I'm going to talk about the broken theory that we need to fix if we're going to, to manage that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, um, uh, in part two, encounter-level racism, um, and then community-level racism. Uh, there's a third level um, but that I won't be able to get to today, and also not really the purview, I think, of social psychologists. All right, so in part one, our broken theory, I start with the question that's really organized almost all of my academic work since I was doing academic work, which is what causes discrimination? The most common definition outside of, uh, of the academy, and sadly too often inside, is that discrimination is caused simply by bad character and bad people. The only problem with this definition, of course, is that it's wrong um, and it doesn't fit the data. So here's what I mean by that. Um, so this is, these are the data taken from uh, what's commonly known as the Princeton Trilogy. I won't make my normal Princeton can't count past three joke here, but these are um, undergraduate endorsements of negative stereotypes uh, about black folks. And what you see from 33 to 2000 is that things get better. It's unlikely to be just demand characteristics and political correctness. Things actually get better. And then in 2008, we elected a black president and everything was fixed and hunky-dory, right? No, because those are attitudes. So the next thing that I want to show you is inequality, right? These are inequalities between black and white expressed as a ratio. But what that means is that if a black child was as likely to die in infancy as a white child, this bar, these red bars, would be hovering here at one. And what we see for infant mortality, unemployment, and poverty is not just that the bars are above one for all of them, but they're going up over time. So how do we do that? In the face of declining prejudice and experienced racial inequality, how do we make sense of that and fix it as psychologists? Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that most common definition is wrong. It's more than bigotry. Now, in the last four years, it should be really clear, it also is bigotry, but it's not just bigotry. If it's not just bigotry, what the heck else is it? But make the argument that situations are incredibly powerful. And if we think about the situations of policing, situations in public safety, we can go a long way to making a lot of things a lot better. <laughs> so that means that we need psychological approaches to policing racism. Situations are key, but we got to decide which ones. Right? And in fact, not just which ones, which we'll know from the literature, other situations that have produced it, but at what level. Right? Because racism, it's not just prejudice, and it doesn't just exist in an audit way, where it's one-on-one. -on -one. If an officer is racist or not, they will treat people equally or not, right? It exists at least in three different levels. And for those who, who study social theories outside of psychology, there's the micro, the meso, and the macro. In the context of policing, we can talk about the encounter, an actual encounter between law enforcement and a resident, the community level, where it's the treatment of the community, or even at the city level. And I'll, I'll give you some visual representations because what good is a psychonomics talk if it doesn't have clip art? Let's imagine one officer, right? And the officer treats people who wear purple differently than people who wear red. People who wear purple get bad treatment. People who wear red get good treatment. This is encounter level discrimination, right? If people who wear purple are all black, people who wear red are all white, you get the idea, right? The officer is treating people from different groups differently. That's the sort of most common level at which social psychologists, any psychologists, are prone to think about things. But it's not the only level at which discrimination, and in fact, patterns of discrimination that uh, uh, accumulate to become racism, occur. At the community level, you can imagine that this same officer, having gone, undergone all of our wonderful trainings, right, then goes into a community, into a neighborhood, treats everybody in that neighborhood the same. Black, white, Asian, Latinx, Native, queer, trans, straight what have you, everybody gets treated the same in that neighborhood. But that same officer treats people in a different neighborhood, or maybe even a different officer treats people in a different neighborhood differently, right? Now there's black and white people in one neighborhood, black and white people in the other neighborhood, straight and queer people in one neighborhood, straight and queer people in the other neighborhood. But if one neighborhood is disproportionately black and the other neighborhood is disproportionately white, 
well, still there's going to be an aggregate difference. Right? There's no such thing in most places that's not really black neighborhoods that are just all uniformly black um, in many urban spaces, but there's majority black. And so the difference in treating how we treat communities aggregates to the individual. You can even imagine it that a group of officers treats everybody in the city the same across neighborhoods. So let's take the greatest city in the history of the world in Philadelphia and another city in Bridgeport. Everybody gets treated the same, but the folks in Philadelphia which is a larger black population than folks in Bridgeport get treated badly across the board. The folks in Bridgeport get treated well. You get the idea, right? The idea is that you can have different levels of this and a psychologist's job should be specify which level we're talking about, talk about the psychological factors that influence each level and the psychological consequences of the outcomes at each level, right? And for most psychologists, we're gonna be focusing on the first two, the, both the encounter level and the neighborhood level. We should at the very least, right? So our goal should be to identify common situations, study those situations, and compare prejudice at the common definition versus situational factors as predictors. All right. Trying to move on to part two, talking about encounter level racism, right? This is that sort of first audit. What are the situations, not just prejudice, the situations that are going to produce discriminatory outcomes? So when officers confronted by stereotype threats, that might do it by anti-egalitarian norms. We have a number of these, but I've only got a limited time, so let's move into it. So what happens when officers confronted by stereotype threat? Well, this is research I've done with Rick Trickner. Um, uh, first when he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, at Yale, and then as an assistant professor uh, in Arizona. Um, and what we did was we were, uh, I, should, I should back up. For those of you who have not been studying this, stereotype threat is the concern with being evaluated in terms of or conforming to a negative stereotype about one's group. Um, so then what is the stereotype about um, police? Well, that they're authoritarian and increasingly that they're racist. Now, why would that predict bias? Why would that predict police doing biased things? Well, it turns out if you're a law enforcement officer, you get tro told you must control an environment in order to be safe, right? Because if, if you think you can hurt me, one of us is going home uh, with an injury. But if you know I'm in control, everybody goes home safe. And they're taught that they have three forms of authority with which um, uh, to achieve that control. They have the legitimate authority, I'm the law. There's social authority, right? Like, I know how to talk to you. Um, like, hey, guy, take it easy. And last, and, and definitely least good, they have coercive, they have physical authority, okay? So what happens is you're supposed to have your legitimate authority, your social authority, and never use your coercive authority unless you have to. But what happens when an officer pulls over a car full of young African-Americans who call that officer racist? What form of authority does that officer have left? Right? If things get a little bit ugly or a little bit tense, they're likely to use coercive authority right away. Right? So stereotype threat is a risk factor right, for increased use of force. So what we did was we uh, worked with a department where we got 786 patrol officers, 80% of the men, 55% of the white. By the way, that's fewer by a percentage uh, of men and white than the vast majority of law enforcement agencies across the country. We measured explicit and implicit bias. We asked them about stereotype threats, concern about being seen as racist, self-legitimacy, and excessive force. And just so you understand, these were all pretty face valid uh, measures of this, right? So for stereotype threat, we asked them, I worry people think I'm racist because I'm a police officer, right? Nothing clever about that. Uh, for self-legitimacy, I'm confident using the authority that has been given to me as a police officer. Um, <clears throat> and for excessive force, we literally asked them, I would approve of an officer striking a suspect who said vulgar or obscene things to, uh, to the officer. It's okay to beat somebody up because you didn't like the way they talked to you. You're taught, by the way, in most police academies, this is the definition of excessive force. All right. Um, so we then put this through the standard. I'm going to show this as the standard sort of uh, four-step uh, uh, mediation analysis. We actually did it in SEM, where we have stereotype threat, unreasonable force, and self-legitimacy. Right. Stereotype threat did predict unreasonable force. The higher the stereotype threat, the lower the self-legitimacy. And self-legitimacy, even controlling for stereotype threat, the more self-legitimacy I had, the less I felt it was okay to use unreasonable force. So much so that when you control for self-legitimacy, the relationship between stereotype threat and unreasonable force, um, unreasonable use of force, uh, went all the way away. It was a full mediation, right? And again, prejudice, when we put this in as a covariate in here, predicts absolutely nothing. It's not a good predictor here. All right, moving along for time constraints, let's talk about the situation of anti-egalitarian norms. This is work that's uh, currently under invited resubmission um, with a current um, postdoctoral fellow and uh, senior research scientist at the Center for Policing Equity, Jill Swanciotis. Um, and here, what we're really talking about is the context of doing policing in the first place. 
So Alpert and Dunham, two giants in criminology, um, have talked about order maintenance policing, which is what the law and order is the order part. So I have to go and I have to, to maintain order in a place. How, if I've got to maintain control, well, then you obeying my authority, that's part of the social order. So, of course, I can beat you up if you've threatened my authority because you have threatened the social order. We thought about that for a little while, and it occurs to us that if the social order also includes a social hierarchy, I might feel more liberated to use force on you in service of that social hierarchy, right? Um, <clears throat> particularly if I personally benefited, so particularly for folks who are higher in, let's say, the racial hierarchy. So here we did this. We've actually now done this in three cities. I'm just going to show you the first two. Uh, we had 135 sworn officers from one city, 303 in another. First is an East Coast. Second is a, a U.S. Southern city. Um, we recruited them at daily roll call. We asked them about social dominance, so the standard social dominance orientation, um, explicit and implicit bias, trust. And we also got five years of citation and stop data and use of force data. Demographics, current rank, you get the, the general idea. We got a bunch of data from them to try and predict what they were going to do. I'll show you the results of the regression model, and then I'll show it visually to you. What we again expected was that for white officers in particular, the more they felt like there, was, there should be social hierarchy, which is literally the social dominance orientation, the more they thought social hierarchy was good, the more force they might feel comfortable using in that context. And that's what we found. The white officers, the more social dominance uh, they endorse, the more they endorse social dominance, I should say, the more their use of force. Ironically, there was a negative effect in the first city for black officers. She said, we didn't predict this. This also didn't replicate across the other two cities where we did pre-registered replications. Um, so the, the real finding is the white officers. That's the one that's robust across a couple of different cities. But this one was interesting. Um, and I think it's worthy of additional study to find out why it, uh, it happened there, and whether or not there's other places where it, it could happen. Um, but in this one city, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, in terms of predicted use of forces per 1,000 citations, Citations are benchmark. It was a proxy for how, how many opportunities they had to be in contact with somebody. Um, for white officers, you see, as it gets to be higher in SDO, it goes up. For black officers, it goes down. And it's relatively flat for officers in all other groups. Last but not least, let's talk about community level. What situations should we be, uh, be thinking about? Right When we talk about um, <clears throat> how to, to look at, at um, racial bias, racial discrimination, racial prejudice, each or any of those in policing, what situations are happening at the community level? Well, first, the conversation and the decisions around what does a district look like? What constitutes a neighborhood? Because that's going to determine who's policing and how. Literally, how we pass our laws, what is and isn't considered to be illegal. I ask everybody who's listening here, if you wanted to go into any city, maybe even the city close to where you live, where is the highest concentration of drug or underage alcohol use? And if you said a dormitory, you'd probably be right. But law enforcement usually doesn't go there on raids because somehow drug and alcohol use there is not the, the danger to the public order that it is majority black uh, and brown communities, assuming that your college or university is not in one, as most colleges and universities are not. How we think about sentencing. We're all probably familiar with the idea that crack um, was uh, put on the books as sentencing, as, as should be sentenced at 10 times longer um, than a sentence for possession of uh, cocaine, powder cocaine. Um, but those decisions about how we sentence all of them are the kinds of rooms where social psychologists are used to thinking about how do we sway those decisions, how does bias operate, right? These are decisions made in a context, and social psychology, social cognition has something to say about it. We can, if we specify the level at which things are, things are happening, have an impact here. So my take-home message, message here, we have only scratched the surface of policing harms. It is shocking to me how much we know about so many other aspects of public life that Target can tell you when you're about to get pregnant. Right? But we absolutely don't have the information to tell you just how many people got shot last year by the police. What we've got is estimates from, from journalists, but not the actual number. That means we need data, we need research, we need a racial lens on it. Because even when we know things about policing, we know very little about its impact in black communities. we got to specify the level on which racism is operating. And if we don't do that, then we're talking just too vaguely, and, and we should get in trouble for that as scientists. And we should know that situations are still powerful. In both of the studies I showed you, prejudice was a, a weak uh, predictor and, and did not uh, influence the model that we put forward. So with that, I don't know if we're going to do questions here because it's Zoom and online, um, but I'm uh, for sure open to it um, and look forward to, to being in touch in any of the modalities that are available to us 
Um, so good to be talking with folks, even if it's remotely. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is David Amodio, and the title of my talk is Visual Dehumanization of Black Americans Under Economic Stress. Before I get started, I would just want to thank the organizers, Angela and Sarah, for letting me participate in this uh, really interesting symposium, and also my collaborators in this work. Amy Crush uh, is uh, an assistant professor of Cornell, though she worked with me and much of this work was her dissertation research and Michael Berkbeal, a current student at NYU and Hope Aloye, who was lab manager on much of this work for me. And of course, the funding from NSF. So during recessions, minorities are the ones who suffer most. This graph just shows how disparities that, that tend to be there between black, Latino and whites in terms of employment uh, expand even further following economic recessions. This is a pattern that we saw in 2008 where uh, unemployment increased a little bit for whites, but very drastically for blacks. And more recently in 2020, where we see again that there is these disparities um, that expanded significantly in the recession that followed the COVID lockdown. Now, there's been a lot of classic research in social psychology and how scarcity affects intergroup bias. Um, scare, actual scarcity and even perceptions of scarcity lead people to um, distribute resources unequally between groups and discriminate more against outgroups. Other work has shown that scarcity can cause people to have more negative attitudes toward minorities, um, give more support to policies that favor the in-group and disadvantage the outgroup, and even lead to discriminatory behavioral allocation of resources to Black people, even in non-zero-sum situations, which means that um, under scarcity, we found that white people give less money to blacks, even when it has no impact on the amount of money that they have to give to whites. Um, in the work that I'm gonna focus on here, we're interested in how scarcity can affect aspects of perception, especially face perception. So whereas the past work looked at how scarcity leads to more negative attitudes and negative behaviors towards minorities, we are interested uh, given that so much of this bias occurs in individual face-to-face -face interactions and decision-making, whether scarcity can also affect the way that people perceive um, minority uh, economic recipients. In our 2014 paper, we asked this question initially, and we basically tested this kind of model. So we asked whether economic scarcity could lead people to visualize um, Black Americans in ways that were more um, negative, and that this type of visualization would lead to um, more discrimination and anti-Black resource allocations. We thought of this as possibly a mechanism through which discriminatory treatment, worse treatment is justified. So if people can see an individual as appearing less deserving in some way, then it uh, might be some sort of implicit justification to give them less. Uh, in a couple of studies, we showed that um, this occurs in the way that people classify bi biracial individuals as black. Just briefly, we showed that people who are primed with, with um, scarcity terms were more likely to see black, um, see biracial individuals as blacker compared with people who were um, subjects who were primed with neutral or negative terms. In a different uh, set of studies, we use the uh, technique called reverse correlation face classifications uh, to to gain renderings of, um, of black faces that a subject was imagining under conditions of scarcity versus a control condition. So without going into that method, these are um, faces that we, that we were able to um, visualize of what participants thought a black person looked like in the scarcity compared with the control condition. And although they look very similar, there are also some subtle differences. And when we showed these faces to independent judges, the face that was uh, created under scarcity was judged as darker in skin tone and also as more stereotypically uh, in their appearance. And uh, in another study with the new sample, we showed that um, when participants were asked to divide money between these two individuals, they thought that these were now degraded pictures of two actual individuals, they gave less money to the person who was depicted by the face produced under scarcity compared with that produced under control. So what these studies seem to suggest is that scarcity does affect at least the mental representation and mental visualizations of Black people in the white American perceiver, and that this has implications for how people um, judge them and treat them. 
Now, in the present work, we ask whether scarcity effects can go beyond inferences of stereotypes and skin and judgments of skin tone to affect the degree to which we see somebody as human. Um, there's no shortage of examples of dehumanization in, uh, uh, in, in terms of intergroup relations in America. Uh, psychological research on the role of visual perception and bias was inspired in part by the police shooting of Amadou Diallo in 1999. Um, this is the case where police thought that his wallet was a gun and they shot him 41 times and killed him. Um, more recently in 2014, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, was shot by an officer who described him in, in later testimony as appearing demon-like. It's as if he saw Michael Brown's uh, face in a, in a less human kind of way. And for some reason that, that um, was associated with him, uh, well, leading to his death. So we asked whether um, these kinds of uh, dehumanized perceptual biases might also occur under conditions of economic scarcity. Um, <clears throat> now you might wonder how could a high level social factor like economic scarcity affect something relatively low level like face encoding. Now face encoding is the extent to which you see a face as um, a holistic human face. So two eye, when you see two eyes, a nose over a mouth and those things are processed as a single configuration and identified as a face. So how can, how can high level factors affect something that's relatively low level like that? Well, first of all, the face configuration um, occurs rapidly in the visual processing. So an uh, image of a face hits the retina. Um, information from that goes back to visual cortex via the thalamus, of course. Anyway, it comes up to um, area of the brain that processes faces. This includes the fusiform, which is associated with configural processing and inferior temporal lobe, which is associated with feature-based processing. Um, these areas have a lot of inputs from higher level regions, um, which make it plausible that the way that um, uh, you might approach an individual or hold expectancies about the individual might affect the way you attend to them. And these, uh, these differences could affect the extent to which you process the face more configurally or feature-based. And to the extent to which you process them more feature-based as opposed to configurally uh, is akin to seeing them as less than human. It's, it's an impediment, it's an impairment or a delay in, in recognizing that that person as having a human face. We know that this is a, a high level inference from low level process in the visual system, but to us, this seemed like the most direct way and literal way of trying to identify a, a pattern of dehumanization in the way that we see somebody. Um, there's been past work by our lab and by some others that have shown that high level social factors can influence um, uh, neural processing of face configurations, of neural of face encoding using the N170 ERP. Um, there's also been behavioral work showing that to the extent that a face is difficult to process configurally, um, that leads to more dehumanized inferences um, inferences of immorality and uh, dehumanized like decision-making. So there does seem to be research suggesting that um, some, some high level factor like scarcity could have an effect on the way that a face is processed at a low level and that could have implications for how they're judged and treated. So in the present work, we asked whether scarcity can impair the configural encoding of black face by white American perceivers. And we want to also know that to the extent this happens, does it also predict discriminatory behavior? So in study one, we asked whether this happens in early visual encoding of black faces using the N170 ERP, looking at the latency effect. And then in study two, we used fMRI to probe the interaction between face encoding and reward process processing to try to understand um, the pathway that from a visual encoding impairment to um, decision-making that has to do with um, allocating less money to a, a recipient. So in study one, again, we asked the scarcity affect the early encoding of black faces. And we use the N170 to index the space encoding. The N170 is um, a widely studied ERP component. It peaks here, I'm showing it with the mouse, um, about 170 milliseconds after a face appears. It's much larger, larger 
For faces compared with virtually all other types of stimuli, there's some caveats to this, but basically this is the main finding. Um, there are multiple sources in N170. Uh, primarily they come from the fusiform and that represents configurable encoding. And then, especially when there's a delay seen in N170, the, the um, generators are coming from the inferior temporal cortex, and that's associated with more feature-based encoding. And these, these effects are picked up most strongly um, on the scalp with using EEG um, with, from sites over the temporal uh, right side temporal occipital region. So that's what we're going to focus on for our measure of face processing of face encoding in this study. <clears throat> So here's the basic procedure. We brought in white subjects, they got prepared for EEG. Then they did this resource allocation task. And in this task, they were told that they could, they might be an allocator or a recipient of money. This was all part of the cover story. Uh, and they were told that they would be randomly assigned by the computer to a role. They saw something looking like this that flipped between roles and ended always on allocator. So all our subjects were gonna allocate money to a set of recipients that they would see. To manipulate scarcity, they saw this pie chart. And so um, subjects in the, whoops, in the scarcity condition saw this pie that um, ticked down from a possible, from possibly representing $100, it ticked down all the way to only $10, a small wedge of the pie. And so subjects thought that this is the amount of money that they would have to allocate on each trial. Subjects in the control condition saw a pie that ticked up to a full pie. Um, in this condition, they thought, the pie represented $10. And so a full pie was 10 out of possible $10. So what, you, what matters here is that in both conditions, they're gonna have $10 on each trial from which to allocate. But in scarcity, subjects thought it was 10 from a possible $100 as opposed to 10 out of $10. We did a lot of pretesting to show that um, subjects in the scarcity condition with this manipulation thought that resources really were more scarce than in the control condition. In the control condition, subjects tend to think of this not as necessarily abundant, but not scarce. So somewhere just like a normal amount of money. Here are some sample trials from the task. So on every, every uh, trial, and this was between subjects, somebody in the scarcity condition would get a prime, or sorry, just, a, just an image to remind them of the scarcity of the resources. And then they saw a face and they were asked to just say, how, how many dollars out of 10 would they give this person? And they were told to just um, judge the deservingness of the person by looking at their face. They did this for white and black faces in randomized order. And subjects in the control condition did the same thing. They just um, were um, primed uh, every time with uh, the full pie to remind them of that condition. Here's the N170 waveform from the study. I'm just showing you this so that it, um, you could see that we got a regular looking N170 and it was larger on the right side as usual. And so when, and, and the results I'm about to present, we scored data from this uh, right-sided N170 waveform. And what I'm gonna show you is the latency of this effect. So our main finding is this, in the control condition, um, the, the latency of the N170 did not differ between black or white faces. It was right about 170 milliseconds, which is the typical timing of this. However, under scarcity, there's the selective decrease, selective increase, sorry, slowdown in the N170. So N170 latency was longer for black faces compared with white faces. And um, this was accompanied by a small bump in amplitude. And so that's the characteristic pattern of um, a shift from more configurable to more feature-based processing in the N170. Okay, so what that suggested is that under scarcity, subjects, our white subjects were um, slightly more impaired at processing black faces configurably compared with white faces. We also wanted to see if this had implications for their behavior, the extent to which they allocated money to um, black and white, white participants or white recipients. And so this is a mediation analysis showing that <clears throat> um, economic scarcity, whether they're in the scarce or control condition, predicted uh, the latency of their N170s. So that's the, the um, impairment in, in processing black faces. Um, and then this in turn was related to um, stronger anti-black money allocations. So giving less money to black than white uh, recipients. And this was a significant indirect effect suggesting that the economic scarcity pattern uh, or effect on money allocation was mediated through configurable processing of black faces. 
So that study showed us is that the early visual configural encoding of black faces was impeded under scarcity. And again, to us, this seemed like the most literal uh, form of perceptual dehumanization that we can imagine. It's like an impediment in whether you see this thing in front of you as a human face. And that in turn uh, predicted anti-black money allocation. In the second study, we wanted to follow up on this and test, um, uh, examine how this encoding deficit in visual processing might affect allocation behavior. And so in particular, we're interested in whether there's this link between visual encoding and reward processing, because that would be a, a link that would get us towards monetary decision-making. And so this study was almost identical to the one I, to study one that I just presented. Um, here we had 35 white participants and we manipulated scarcity within subjects. And this, is, this had to do with um, methods and the way we analyze the data with fMRI. But um, here subjects did block, separate blocks in which they um, received the scarcity manipulation or the control manipulation. And these were counterbalanced, otherwise it was identical. And uh, in this study for each subject, we first um, did a uh, functional localizer to identify face specific regions in their fusiform uh, cortices. And this was orthogonal to the conditions of the study. So for each subject, we, we quantified activity in that region. And then we use that as our main outcome measure. And here we found that in the control condition, there's no difference in fusiform activity between, for black compared with white faces. But in the scarcity conditions, there's again, the selective decrease in activity for black faces compared with white faces. So now when we're talking about fusiform activity, this decrease suggests um, a decrease in configural processing of faces, which again, which replicates what we saw with the N170 latency. Um, again, we are interested in how this pattern might relate to reward processing. And so um, we ran a PPI analysis, psychophysiological interaction analysis, um, to see whether there are regions of the brain that this pattern of activity in the fusiform might correlate with. And we had a couple of regions of interest. Um, the only one that, that showed an effect was um, a region of the striatum, which is often associated with reward processing. And what we found is that um, there's, first of all, there's this coupling between um, Selective uh, reduced fusiform to black faces under scarcity was coupled with the same pattern for the striatum. And the degree of this coupling, which is represented on the x-axis here, was correlated with um, the degree to which people gave less money to blacks under scarcity compared with whites and compared with the control condition. So um, again, what this analysis suggests is that um, the fusiform and the striatum seem to operate in tandem and perhaps in a pathway, although we, of course, we cannot test this with this correlational data, these correlational data, but um, visual processing and reward processing might operate in tandem to um, produce uh, uh, bias in behavior. <clears throat> so to summarize, what we found in these studies is that scarcity impaired white's neural encoding of black faces. And this suggests a decrease in configural visual encoding and a shift towards feature-based encoding of faces. So again, this is this pattern of um, perceptual dehumanization that we're talking about. We also found in both studies that this encoding impairment was linked, uh, sorry, in the MRI study that this impairment was linked to reduced reward processing. And I'll acknowledge this is a reverse inference, you know, based on what we know about the striatum. Um, however, we did a lot of work to, to consider alternatives and rule them out to um, at least suggest that this is a plausible inference of what was going on in this study. Um, this is published in a 2019 paper in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And so if you're interested, please check it out there. Um, and in both studies, we showed that the scarcity effect on face encoding predicted behavioral discriminant in cash allocations. So um, between those studies, those, those suggested that scarcity does lead to this perceptual dehumanization of black faces and that has implications for behavior. And one limitation of that work though, is that we have these neural indices of visual processing um, as our measures of dehumanization. We didn't actually ask about psychological inferences of dehumanization. And so we wanted to run some follow-ups to see if these same kind of manipulations might lead to 
um, psychological inferences of dehumanizations too that would parallel what we saw in the neural activity. So um, I'll just mention these kind of briefly, but we asked whether scarcity really enhances the psychological um, pattern uh, form of dehumanization. And in these studies, we use a reverse correlation method to um, have participants visualize black faces under scarcity versus control conditions. It's basically what we did um, used in uh, our 2014 paper with Amy and I. And then, however, in this, these studies, we um, had these resulting images rated in terms of dehumanized traits. So I'm gonna try to run through this rather quickly, um, but this involved having an initial study of subjects, a uh, sample of subjects, and we, they thought that they were gonna do this allocation task where they're gonna divide money or allocate money to black or white uh, recipients. We used the same manipulations of scarcity between subjects that I mentioned before with these pie charts. However, before, they started making their allocations, we had them do this face classification task. So in this task, they saw um, 400 pairs of faces that looked very similar, but they were subtly different. And on, for each pair, the subject had to indicate which of these two was the African-American person. And what the subject didn't know was that every single one of the faces was an image that was created from one single base image. And this base image is a morph of 100 black and 100 white faces. And what we did to create the unique um, classification images, or the, sorry, the, yeah, the, the images that they categorized was we put um, patterns of visual noise on top of this base face. So we had different, different unique patterns of visual noise to create subtly different faces that you see here in these example stimuli. Now the idea with reverse correlation is once the subject goes through 400 trials and they indicate which of the faces, which, which of the pair is an African-American person, um, what you do is you take all of the faces that they selected, remove the base image from it, take those noise patterns and average them all together, bring the base face back in underneath that. And what you have there is a, a composite classification image, which presumably represents what the, what the um, participant had in mind when they're thinking about what a black person looks like. Um, and then they, they yeah they finish out the test by making some allocation decisions just to continue with the cover story. But what's important for us is that these are the composite images that we got from subjects in the scarcity condition compared with the control condition. Again, they look pretty similar, but there are subtle differences. And we wanted to know if those differences mattered. Um, in order to present them to new participants, one thing we did is we actually created um, subgroup classification so that we didn't have only one image representing each condition. We had four different images representing each condition. This addresses some other recent concerns with this method that I won't get into. Um, and we showed pairs of faces that were produced by scarcity or control participants to a new set of participants. And these, partic these new participants rated these faces on traits that have been associated with dehumanization. And here's a list. Um, maybe you could pause the presentation if you want to read some of these, but there are traits that relate to either agency or experience or just general humanity or likability <clears throat> from Gray et al. in 2007. So um, this new set of subjects, they had no idea where these faces came from. They're just asked to view a pair. And one was always from the control condition. The other was always from the scarcity condition. And they would be asked questions such as this, which of these is more capable of thinking? As a, example question. And they were forced to choose um, either the one on the right or the one on the left to varying degrees. And what we found in this initial study was that that face produced by control subjects was viewed as more generally human than the face produced by scarcity subjects. We followed this up with um, a new sample to replicate it and also um, to break down the different subdimensions of, of humanization. And with this sample, we saw the same pattern but the face produced in the control condition uh, was judged more generally human and also more human in terms of having uh, human-like experiences. The agency effect wasn't significant, although it was trending in the same direction. So again, um, the, the black person that um, people under scarcity imagine is viewed as less human, just generally, and also especially in terms of their experience more than agency. Um, compared with the face that was visualized in the control condition. Um, one last part of this is we took those same faces and we wanted to know if um, this, this kind of um, 
perceptual dehumanization might have more serious implications. So we are interested in implications such as um, uh, for the criminal justice decisions. This is inspired, like much of this work, um, by research that was done by Jennifer Eberhardt and Phil Goff on how um, uh, black people can be dehumanized based on their appearance with implications for things like um, death sentence eligibility. So here we showed subjects those same face images produced either under scarcity or in control condition um, in a context where the, they represented people who were um, convicted of some crimes. And we made sure the various crimes were equated on things like the severity and the um, implications for sentencing. Subjects saw these and they rated them on, on um, items that related to their culpability for the crime, their morality, and the degree to which they should be punished, as well as some neutr uh, neutral filler traits, which allowed us at least to show that, um, you know, not everything is affected by scarcity, but the only things that we are theoretically think are related. And we found that um, compared with the face produced under scarcity, the, the control face, um, I'm sorry, compared with the control face, the face produced under scarcity was judged as more immoral and also more punishable in, in these extreme fashions, like, um, longer uh, parole, uh, sorry, um, less eligibility for parole, greater, greater eligibility for a death sentence. Interestingly, scarcity phases weren't judged as being more culpable for the crime. So it's, it appears as if, even though subjects uh, say that these, these individuals are equally guilty, it's the black person visualized under scarcity who is nonetheless more immoral and um, should be punished more harshly. So what those studies showed us is that scarcity also induces the psychological dehumanization of black faces in terms of their visual representations with implications for judgments of morality and punishment. This pattern corroborates the effects that we found with the N170 and the MRI, um, which were all just neural encoding of faces, um, but they, they definitely match what we were thinking theoretically in terms of the implications. Let me give you some broad conclusions and wrap up. Um, <clears throat> So what we found in these studies is that perceptions of economic scarcity can affect the encoding and visualization of racial minority faces. This affects allocation bias, uh, um, so giving less money to blacks than whites. And it also seems to have implications for people's judgments of a, of a target individual's morality and criminality. We think that this could function strategically to justify discrimination. So this doesn't appear to be a, a deliberative effect or maybe even intentional. But at some level, if scarcity leads people to be um, to, to care more about their in-group and want to want to um, protect resources, this might reflect um, some implicit strategy to see out-group members, especially um, Black people in America, as um, less deserving, and that would justify more discriminatory behaviors. For the same reasons I just mentioned, that this is probably not deliberative and um, or intentional, this kind of effect seems like it's very difficult to detect and thus control. So um, interventions that have been used to try to increase the control of bias, which require that you are aware that there's bias in the first place, probably wouldn't work here. So this has suggested to us that we need to come up with new interventions that can circumvent these kinds of visual effects. Um, and so uh, I'll end by, again, uh, thanking my collaborators, Amy Crush, Mike Berkbeel, uh, Hope Loye, and also my, our many research assistants. Um, thanks to NSF. And also, if you're interested in this work or uh, other work from our lab, you can, you can check it out and download papers from emodialab.org. So overall, I hope you um, found this interesting. And also, I hope I convinced you that perceptions of scarcity in terms of um, the economy can change the way that we see racial minorities in America, particularly black people here. And that seems to have an impact on the way that we treat them. Thanks again for including me. And uh, I'll look forward to our conversation in the um, discussion session later. Thanks. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for being here. My name is Sarah Gaither, and I'm an assistant professor in the psychology and neuroscience department at Duke University. I'm really honored to be here because this is actually my first time to attend Psychonomics, even though it is virtually, of course, this year. Um, and it was really exciting for me to work with some of the organizers of this conference to help brainstorm which researchers we could bring you to really highlight some aspects of considering diversity and different types of psychology research all of you might be doing. 
So today I'm going to be highlighting a recent meta-analysis that me and my colleagues just had published this year that's focusing today on how we categorize racially ambiguous or racially mixed spaces within this hypodescent framework, which I'll explain later on. And then I'll follow up this with two in-progress studies that we're trying to get published right now that's actually working to test the generalizability of how it is we categorize racially mixed or racially ambiguous spaces. So to start off, first I want to show you this space and ask all of you to think about how you might racially or ethnically categorize this space. What cues or features are you going to use <clears throat> to decide if the space is an in-group member or an out-group member? What are the different motivational processes that you might have in your mind right now in trying to decide if this person is like you or not like you? And what features, whether it's skin tone, the specific facial features, are hinting at what racial or ethnic group this person might belong to? These are all the different cognitive processes that take place every single time we meet someone new. We're constantly categorizing people and trying to put them into boxes. Well, this space is a face gen computer generated face that has been used very commonly within the multiracial face categorization literature. And this space is supposed to represent a face that's equally blended, that's half white and half black, making it a biracial black white face. But again, many of you maybe saw other racial or ethnic groups, and that's what makes studying racially ambiguous spaces to me so incredibly interesting. All of you might have different experiences that will shape how you see each individual person in your life. And so all of this stems from social categorization. I'm not going to spend very much time going over this, but one thing I wanted to highlight is that perceivers in general, so all of us walking around our social world, we really prefer this either or thinking about social groups. When you see one, someone who's racially ambiguous or gender ambiguous, politically ambiguous, it's hard for our brains to process those types of stimuli because we have this such a strong tendency to want to put people into one box over the other. And so because we have this struggle with ambiguity, this usually leads to all of you using some form of a cognitive shortcut. Again, you'll look at the nose shape or skin color, hairstyle, the clothing that someone is wearing, maybe the accent or the way that they're speaking. All of those things are these shortcuts that we know can shift how it is we see someone socially. So this space, I'm gonna bring it up again for all of you to sort of think about how it is you categorize this. And in the field, there's actually two different um, frameworks that we have here that are really looking at whether it's called hypodescent or the in-group over-exclusion effect. And hypodescent is one of these one drop rule historical lineage um, terminologies that we use to sort of describe how it is we think the majority of people see racially ambiguous black white faces. So hypodescent means if you see the face just like this, if you see one drop in this space that is not considered white, you're gonna be more likely to categorize that face as black, this hypodescent. You're going downward in the social hierarchy as we have it established in American society, and you're gonna be more likely to see this face as black. So that one drop rule is very alive and well when it comes to racial categorization is what a lot of research has been arguing to date. However, there's another effect that I wanted to highlight for all of you known as the in-group over-exclusion effect. This effect has been studied and cited much more often within European um, psychology research compared to the US. And what they argue is, again, if you see one drop of something that's not like you, you're gonna be more likely to categorize that face as an out-group. But that out-group doesn't necessarily have to be a minority group. So for instance, if you see this face, you might actually see it more often as white if you yourself are not a member of the white racial group. So these are the two conflicting theories that have been cited over time. I've always sort of thought the in-group over exclusion effect seemed to be a much more universal way of thinking about how it is we categorize ambiguous spaces. And so that's what led to the meta-analysis um, that me and my colleagues, really spearheaded by Danielle Young at Manhattan College, um, to try and look across the literature do we actually see strong hypodescent outcomes? Do we see this one drop rule and categorization effect? Or is it something more like the in-group over exclusion effect? Do we find more variation in how it is we see multiracial faces depending on the context, the stimuli, and the participants or the perceivers that are recruited? So in this paper, we analyzed 107 studies from 58 papers across the years from 2000 to 2018. And the samples, just to give you an idea, 44% of these samples were undergrads only, so these convenient samples that we love using in psychology. Another 24% of them were from Mechanical Turk, and 71% of them were actually US or American samples, meaning we know very little about how it is we categorize these spaces in other regions around the world. The last thing I wanted to note just for the samples is that 46% of the studies were actually white participants only, 
And the majority of these studies actually collapsed across participant race, meaning they didn't even think about using participant race as an analysis factor when trying to analyze something that's so incredibly racialized, such as what race these multiracial spaces actually are. So to us, it was really surprising to see how many psychologists over this 18 year span really were studying something that was racialized, but not taking participant race into consideration. So briefly, some of the results that we found from this, I'm not gonna highlight all of them, is first we found that overall across all of these studies, hypodescent was really not a reliable effect. So as much as a lot of the psychology literature will argue that we're always doing this one drop rule categorization, our meta-analysis actually does not support this type of process and how it is we're categorizing ambiguous spaces. Studies with only white perceivers were the only ones that marginally supported a hypodescent framework. The second there were any racial or ethnic minorities collapsed within that sample, those hypodescent effects actually went away. And so some other things we noticed in our meta-analysis that hypodescent or this one drop rule tendency might be contingent on is A, using male stimuli. When female stimuli was used, we also found a dramatic drop in any of these hypodescent tendencies. Biracial black-white stimuli has been used for the majority of research across the multiracial categorization field, meaning that if you're Asian white, black Asian, white Latino, we don't really know how hypodescent or an in-group over exclusion effect may actually um, process how people see you. And the last thing that we noted in our meta-analysis was that the task or the methods that researchers are using are also pretty predictive of finding this more hypodescent outcome. So a forced choice dichotomous task, so is this space black or white, when there are only two choices available, that's also when you see an increase in this hypodescent outcome. So this is really important, I think, for all face categorization researchers to keep in mind that these are strong, strong predictors of shifting how it is we see particularly ambiguous stimuli. Now, one way we're trying to test this now in the lab is two different studies. The first is going to be looking at, well, does racial group membership really affect hypodescent? Do we see this? So I have a set of studies with adults and kids. I'll show you very briefly to actually test the role that racial group membership is playing with this one drop rule categorization outcome. And then secondly, since 71% of all of the research on multiracial categorization were from US samples, I actually have some new data with a collaborator in Taiwan where we cross-culturally compare how these spaces are processed. So first is the stimuli that we used across these two studies. First, as you'll see here, this is a picture of a real biracial person. So as I started this talk, that was a computer-generated face gen face, which are nice, perfectly controlled experimental stimuli that can allow you to really analyze how it is perfectly controlled stimuli are analyzed. And I say that because a real biracial face clearly is not as perfectly controlled as a one that's computer generated. And so in collaboration with Jackie Chen, we published a paper um, in 2018 that actually shows that real biracial faces have this one drop rule or this hypodescent outcome that occurs more often on a real biracial face than these perfectly controlled computer stimuli. So we have 20 biracial black white faces that were pre-tested on ambiguity, attractiveness, affect, and we selected 12 of them for this study since we're gonna be testing this on both adults and kids. Um, and then in the cross-cultural study, we actually recruited another sample of biracial Asian white individuals. Again, these, these were pre-tested by adults in the US and also by adults in Taiwan to make sure again that they're equally seen as racially ambiguous in both contexts. Um, so there'll be a total of 12 faces shown in each of these studies. So what we did in the adult study first in the US was we recruited 300 adult participants from a Qualtrics panel. Um, this was an equally gender balanced sample. We recruited 75 white, 75 black, 75 Asian, and 75 biracial black white adults to all see how they would categorize on a forced choice dichotomous test, just like our meta-analysis showed, if the face on the top, the racially ambiguous face, was more often seen as white or black. So they did 12 of these trials. And here are the results. What you see here is that only white adults are showing this hypodescent or one drop rule categorization outcome. They're really showing that only white adults are categorizing these spaces more often as black. But when you look at two of our racial minority groups, both black adults and Asian adults are actually significantly below chance. This means they're actually showing what we would call hyperdescent or the tendency to categorize these spaces more often as white. And if you look at our last column here, the biracial black white adults, they're actually exactly at chance levels. So this suggests that growing up again with this flexible racial identity, being exposed to lots of different races over time, 
and being a member of the biracial community yourself, you actually aren't showing a bias in seeing these faces as either more often white or more often black. We followed up this study with a child sample. So these are three to six year old children recruited from the Chicago area. And here you find the exact same adults. Only white children, again, are showing this hypodescent tendency and categorizing these faces more often as black. Our moderational black children, they're significantly below chance levels here, meaning again, they're showing this hyperdescent or white categorization outcome. And our biracial children, these are biracial children from any multiracial background. They're again at chance levels exactly like our whole sample. Um, so to us, this was really exciting research. And then we actually followed up the kid data to make sure that the skin tone bias really is alive and well early on in development. And we showed with a multicultural Crayola crayon set that children also picked one of these crayons and the color or the shade of these eight skin tone shades of crayons actually strongly correlated with their categorization tendency. So the more likely they were to choose a darker crayon to color in that smiley face to make it look like this additional biracial face on the end of the screen, the more likely that same child was to categorize more of the faces as black. So two different ways to actually measure the social categorization process and the skin tone biases or color biases that we're seeing forming early on within child development. So to summarize first is this racial group membership question of generalizability. The in-group over exclusion effect seems to be present very early on in development. We're not seeing a hypodescent outcome. Minority adults and minority children were both showing that they're more likely to see these biracial black white faces as white or as their outgroup this in-group over exclusion effect. So hypodescent is really only one side of the ambiguous categorization story, really meaning just like our meta-analysis that it's more likely to appear for white perceivers. Now cross-cultural differences is something else that hasn't been done a ton in the literature. And so we did a literature review and actually discover that only 10% of developmental papers actually feature non-Western participants. This already is a problem on its own, regardless of what area of research you might be interested in. So we recruited Taiwanese children with my collaborator, Serena Chen at China Medical University. Um, this is a picture of Taichung, Taiwan, which is where she's located. Um, and so these were children, around 74 of them we recruited. Um, the mean age was around age five. And a little bit of background on Taichung, Taiwan is it is 95% Han Chinese, with the other 5% being various other Asian ethnic minorities. Um, this is a very large city, 2.8 million people. Um, but this is a very homogeneous environment, right? 95% of people who live in Taichung are all from the same racial or ethnic background. So in contrast, we recruited Asian American children in Durham, North Carolina, which is where Duke is located. And to give you some stats about Durham, North Carolina, here we actually have a 5% Asian population. And that's collapsing across East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, it's a very small percentage in our city. Um, otherwise, our city is considered 42% white, 41% black, 14% Hispanic, and 3% multiracial. Our city is also much smaller in comparison to Taichung in that we only have 300,000 people. But still two city environments, one very racially or ethnically homogeneous, and one much more racially or ethnically mixed. And so we wanted to see across these two samples, how do they see these same biracial stimuli? both biracial black-white stimuli and biracial Asian-white stimuli. We also asked the children um, what their thoughts were about their own essentialist beliefs. I'm not gonna go over that task today, but essentialism, for those of you that might not be familiar, is how fixed you think about social categories. We know that adults are much more essentialist than children. We think more fixed. Once we're born black, we're black forever. Once we're born a girl, we're a girl forever. These kinds of stable qualities about social categories. So you will see our data broken up by kids with this essentialist reasoning and without this essentialist reasoning. So the data I'm first gonna show you here is the data for those same exact biracial black-white stimuli I showed you on the previous study. Um, here, this is the probability of choosing one of those spaces as being black or categorizing those spaces as being black. And here, red bars are gonna be those children with essentialist thinking. So children who think a little more adult-like in how they consider race um, being a stable category or trait. And the blue bar is going to be those without this adult-like thinking about race or the non-essentialist thinkers. And so what you see here is that Taiwanese children actually were significantly below chance levels. Um, so you see that here in experiment one. These are our Taiwanese children. Um, didn't matter about their essentialist thinking. 
Asian American children were also significantly below advanced levels, again, regardless of their essentialist thinking. So really what this is showing is that both of these groups cross-culturally are seeing these biracial black white faces more often again as white or as this hyper descent kind of outcome. We also were looking at these um, studies and I see that there's a typo on this slide here, but I don't want to stop my recording, um, that the cross-cultural results for Asian white biracial faces um, are going to be shown in the same way. So here it's going to be the probability of choosing Asian as the outcome. Again, red bars are those children with essentialist thinking. Blue bars are those without their essentialist thinking. And again, here you see Taiwanese children in that, those experiment one columns with essentialist thinking were significantly below chance, right? So if they're thinking about race as an adult would, they're actually more likely to still maintain the status of seeing an Asian white face more often as white or as their outgroup. They're not doing an in-group categorization. Um, but Taiwanese children without essentialist beliefs were actually significantly above chance, right? And so they're actually a little more flexible in seeing these Asian white faces more often as a member of their in-group. We actually didn't find any differences at all for our Asian American children. Regardless of if they have essentialist thinking or not, they're really around chance levels and seeing these spaces either as Asian or as white, so either as an in-group versus an out-group member. So really to summarize this new cross-cultural work with children, we showed that these results really are continuing to support a hyper-descent framework for biracial black-white faces. We see that for racial and ethnic minority populations, including across two very different cultural and racially mixed and racially homogeneous contexts, that biracial black white faces are more often than not seen as white or as a dominant outgroup. This is really important to consider within a Taiwanese context because Serena Chen, my collaborator, says how much Taiwanese people tend to accentualize uh, Western ideologies, Western media. So white to them really is a dominant outgroup, much like it would be for an Asian American child growing up in Durham. So really this is supporting this meta-analysis that we find this increase of hyperdescent tendencies um, or hyperdescent tendencies with biracial black-white stimuli, right? We're really finding this more fixed way of categorizing these faces there. But biracial Asian white faces told a slightly different story, right? This may actually be perceived in a more fixed-like pattern in predominantly Asian contexts. We did find very different outcomes for our Asian American children who again, didn't show a bias on how to categorize these Asian white faces. Whereas our Taiwanese children, if they had this adult-like thinking about race, they were more likely to think those ambiguous faces were white or the outgroup. Um, so since only Taiwanese children showed this increase in white outgroup categorization, we think that maybe there's something developmentally um, going on, that as you're learning how to categorize ambiguous faces, your preference or your experience being a minority versus a majority group member might actually be shifting how it is you're seeing these faces and your willingness to see someone as either an in-group or an out-group member. For an Asian American child, particularly within a Durham, North Carolina context, it's only 5% of our population. So perhaps that own lived experience is motivating them to see more ambiguous spaces like themselves in order to boost up that sense of self and that sense of belonging. So the main takeaways that I want all of you to consider in your work going forward is that first, you've all probably heard that we have a weird problem in psychology research across all disciplines and areas of research. Um, they really argue that these are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples. That's who we tend to recruit. That's who tends to show up in our lab. Those are also the people oftentimes we even recruit on our online panel samples, which are popularly used now. I would argue that this W also really tends to mean white because based on this meta-analysis, and hopefully I've convinced you across these two other sets of brand new data, that the W could also be white. And we really shouldn't be making any theories, particularly racialized theories, when our samples are focused on predominantly white samples, because there's many other racial and ethnic groups in our societies that might have a very different experience and a very different perception. So this highlights the need for us going forward as a field of researchers to really test how universal some of our theories are and aren't. Um, where do we draw these in-group and out-group lines? And when you see someone who doesn't neatly fit into one category, what are the real world experiences, identities, group memberships and exposures that you might have had that's going to shift whether or not you consider someone as an in-group versus an out-group member. And then finally, I've shown you here across a few studies that race, culture, stimuli, the methods that we choose and whether it's a two-choice versus a three-choice task, all of these things dramatically shift how it is we see another human face. 
And so I encourage all of you today to really think about what other types of things have been excluded in your own work. What types of limitations on your own stimuli have you used? And are you sure that everything that you found in your lab is going to generalize to other more diverse populations? And so with that, I'd like to thank some of our funding um, sources over the years for these projects, in addition to all of my collaborators on these projects. And I thank you all so much for listening. Have a great Psychonomics. Thank you for those excellent talks. Um, in monitoring the questions coming in on the q and I first want to direct one to Mazarin that came up for a couple talks. So Sasha and Mandeep both asked variants of the questions about, are the participants in your experiments all white? This also dovetails on one of the points Sarah was making. Um, do you find any differences for participants who are non-white? So the, the great thing about being on the web, which we've been on the web since 1998, when the web was not very well developed, and we knew something was going on, because in the first month in which we put the IAT on our website, we had 45,000 completed tests in one month. So, and, and, and thankfully, they were not all white subjects. So it became very easy for us to track. And over time, as you know, we have millions and millions of tests taken. So we can say quite a bit about what the data look like for very different categories of people. So the first thing to say is that in, in psychology, if there's one ubiquitous result, it is that people like members of their own group, we have a name, we call it in-group bias. So when we saw the data of white Americans just on the basic IAT, okay, and you see that 70, 75% show white preference, that didn't surprise us. But I think we would have expected to have seen exactly the reverse and symmetric effect for African Americans. If in-group bias is, is as ubiquitous as it is, then 70, 75% of black Americans should show pro-black bias and everything in the world is as is with different groups each liking their own. But that is not what the results showed. And since then, they have been corroborating this result over and over again, that members of disadvantaged minority groups do not show nearly the same in-group love as members of dominant majority groups do. So if 75% of white Americans show it, show in-group preference, and something like 40% of black Americans show in-group bias, 40% actually show out-group favoritism, and 20% are somewhere in between. Your question also was a question about the Asian test and the animal human test that I showed you today. So let me just be very clear. On the Asian white test, the result I described is true when you just look at the population as a whole, consisting mostly of white Americans. When you look at Asian Americans, what is interesting is that the data go back and forth depending on where you are studying it in the country. So, so if you happen to be in a region where there are more Asian Americans, even if you're white, you show this bias less that Asians can't be American, right? Asians themselves vary. They're not robustly showing that Asians are American themselves. It is a weaker effect than, than uh, you, would, you would think it should be given that they're Asian, they know they're American, and, but it is definitely different than white. And finally, in the animal human one, if you look at the data of black Americans, just like with the IAT, black Americans on animal human are neutral. That is to say they're accurate. They're saying black, white, equally human. They are obviously equally human, not so for white Americans, right? Great, thank you. A question for Sarah from Diane. I wonder what you might find by examining Asian American children who live in a densely Asian area in America, Asian area in America like cities with prominent cultural neighborhoods like Chinatowns, Koreatowns, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think in comparison to our kids in Taiwan where it's majority Asian context, where you're living and whether you feel like a majority group member or the person in power is really what's gonna shift how you see these ambiguous spaces. So if I'm an Asian American child living in Koreatown, maybe when I'm in that individual space, I feel like a majority group member, but what would matter, I think, particularly in the US context is how much other outgroup contact that Asian American child is still getting. They're still knowing growing up as an Asian American kid in America that they are a minority. Uh, we find the same cognitive flexibility issues, the reduced in-group biases as Mazarin is pointing out with Asian American children compared to white children. So I do think that the way race is socially constructed in the US might actually limit some of those majority effects, um, but it's an empirical question. So if anyone would love the stimuli and lives in an, an environment with more Asian children and Asian people, please let me know. 
Great. A uh, question for David. Uh, two related questions came in from Benjamin and Michael asking, is the scarcity effect on re facial recognition really a white versus black effect or is it more of an in-group out-group effect? Scarcity seems relevant for protecting one's in-group. So do you think you'd get similar effects with any other in-group out-group comparison? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, traditionally, uh, scarcity effect um, minimal groups. And so, uh, yes, these scarce types of scarcity effects have been shown traditionally with, with just groups, not with race. However, when we were interested in scarcity, it was motivated by um, things that were happening in society, like the massive job loss following the recession of 2008. And uh, so those effects that, we, that I presented, I think show a mix of an in-group out-group effect but um, in the context of race, where you've got white perceivers who have certain status and there are certain stereotypes and tendencies to dehumanize uh, Black Americans. So um, I think elements of it could just be based on in-group, out-group, but I think the full scope of what we are showing is really the dynamic of white Americans' views of Blacks. We have other work, I should say, where we've, we've manipulated just in-group, out-group membership and showed some similar kinds of effects. One of the big themes from Dr. Goff's talk was about the power of the situation. And I wanted to open it up to all the panel to ask how you would advise cognitive psychologists to think about the situation in terms of the type of work that's being done. Context is everything, is what I would say. Right. Um, so, so look, uh, I'm not asking that all psychologists study everything. Okay? I'm one of those people who has for the longest time said, study your stuff at the most basic level. You need not do all kinds of things, everything, because our basic work is all important. And if you never do anything with any application, that is completely okay. Those results will someday have great impact. I just think that when I look at the way in which people describe their theories and the power of their theories, there is a tendency to say all humans when in fact the data have only come from some humans. And that's where I think we have to be a little bit watchful. And one of the things to look at is how situationally constrained they are. And I think if you look at that pain study that I described, it's really stunning what situation even means. You could be from somewhere in the North, you could move to the South and now you become like that, peop that, that group of people uh, 140 years ago. So that's how important situations are. I think I would add to that and say that I think one thing that we can all do as psychologists, regardless of what we're studying, is really just be cognizant of who it is we are recruiting and the study environments that we're setting up for our data collection, right? These things aren't necessarily going to translate across different racial and ethnic groups or gender groups. And so really thinking through is your survey, those questions, are those actually initiating a different response or a different feeling based on a person's own demographic backgrounds? And so I think one thing we can all do going forward in our papers is just be really honest about who our samples are and who our samples are not in order to get further in this question of generalizability and how universal some of our findings may or may not be. Those are all great points. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I have to add to it. Well, except that many of our studies show that even simply looking at a face is affected by um, a person's mindset, um, demographic differences, uh, just a lot of subtle things that could go on in the laboratory can affect the, the way that a, a subject's acting. We didn't even get into the issue of um, uh, subjects' concerns about being evaluated regarding the way that they're they're looking at faces. That, that refers to work, other kinds of work that we've done. So, if cognitive psychologists are thinking about how social psychologists study cognitive things, you'll notice that we spend a lot of time considering all these situational factors, even though the measures we use might seem very similar. All right, thank you all. Um, I do wanna encourage attendees to keep submitting questions. Um, we are monitoring that and feel free to ask about specific quest questions about the talks or broader questions about this area or the intersection of social and cognition, all fair game. So another question that came in um, was by Michelle asking again for the panel at large, how much do you think a cognitive psychologist would need to understand social psychology if they are to st appropriately study racism and discrimination? And to broaden that a bit more, um, for those new to this topic, as many in the audience are, and who want to start to measure race in their work and start to consider it, what advice would you have? 
ha I'm happy to pitch in. Uh, I have had the great fortune in my career of having been forced to transcend um, boundaries because people, when we did the IAT work, people just wouldn't believe it, right? They would say, it's just not X, it's not that. And I thought my behavioral studies were totally wonderful. Why would I need to ever look at the brain? Because these were even better studies than at the time in the late 90s, we could have done anything with imaging. And I, sadly, I was wrong. You know, One actually not very good imaging study we did um, basically shut people up in a way that the behavioral data never had. So to do that work, Liz Phelps was uh, my collaborator and she had been saying for a long time, we should look at this with imaging, we should look at this. And I would say, why? I don't need to do that. I have, I have pretty good uh, behavioral evidence that's much finer grained than anything uh, you know, a simple spatial map would give me. But she was so right, you know, doing that one imaging study and we showed that activation to black over white faces uh, was correlated, uh, at least in, in, the, in the amygdala, um, with uh, IAT scores, higher the race bias on the IAT outside the magnet, predicted greater activation to black relative to white faces in the magnet. And it was remarkable how it suddenly, the conversation just sort of, the, 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 the silly part of the conversation did die out very quickly. So I'll say that for me, it's been really great. And so I could not assume that I know anything about imaging and I was not prepared to do it <clears throat> by myself. And then 10 years later, I saw that there was a similar issue where um, I noticed that we'd never asked the question of where does all this come from? We'd never asked the, 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 the question of, is this true across species? Is this true in young children? How early does it emerge? Now, you cannot just overnight become a developmental psychologist. There are apparently lots of things that are unique to two-year-olds that I would never know. Um, and so again, you do it collaboratively. And so I would say, Yes, you should learn something, but the best thing you can do is get a great collaborator who will make sure that your designs show uh, knowledge of that field. Sarah or David, anything to add? You endorse collaboration? I would, I would, I would co-sign everything that Mazarin just said. I, as someone who was trained as a social psychologist, but then did a postdoc in developmental psychology, I think, you know, also creating opportunities for yourself. Um, what I don't think we would want anyone to leave the symposium thinking is that all of you should just go try and study race for fun. Um, please make sure you're, you're thinking through that process, who you're recruiting, how you're recruiting them. Um, the other piece of advice, if this is something some of you are considering and you're gonna go for community samples, is it takes a long time to create trusting relationships with minority communities. And so the other thing I would just put out as a disclaimer for everyone listening is to not just walk into a random historically black church and ask for their help. You need to create those relationships with your neighboring partners. Um, and that's something else that again, a collaborator, whether it's a friend who happens to be a member of that church can help you get access to populations that are actually even more generalizable than only recruiting black undergrads at your college or university. So those will just be some other things. Yeah, and my two cents would simply be that um, if a cognitive psychologist is interested in issues of race, um, there really is a lot of depth and detail in the way that social psychologists have studied this that might not be obvious um, from the start. And it's the same way if a social psychologist is getting into neuroscience or cognitive psychology, there's, there's so many different ways that people think about it in those fields that you really, um, th there's a lot to learn. And so, um, a lot of these social studies are more than simply manipulating faces. There's a lot of considerations about people's identities and the situations and uh, a lot of other complexities that go into it. So yeah, just con consider that going into it. And so everything else that uh, Sarah and Mazarin said, I also signed off on. From your position Great as points. social psych, uh, from your position as social psychologists, I mean, this may not be an entirely fair question, but let's see what you can do with it. Um, what do you think cognitive psychologists are particularly well positioned to study in terms of helping to contribute to studying experiences related to race and ethnicity? Any thoughts on that? Mechanism. To me, it's, I, I can tell you that uh, when I look at the data from social, psych, so, social psychology labs, um, <clears throat> The, the one frustration I have is that we're still at the level of describing, right? We can show you that X percent of this group or that group, you know, we can show you the result, 
<clears throat> but you have to be trained in understanding how perception works or how attention works or how language uh, and labels might change how we perceive things to be able to get at mental representation. And no matter what kind of psychologist you are, you know, you can be interested in anything, but fundamentally you're interested in the mind and you're interested in representation. As I said in my talk, that's the one thing that we can take to the bank that we know more than anybody else about that. And so I would say there is a huge amount for cognitive psychologists to contribute just by being cognitive psychologists. They don't have to stretch. They don't have to do anything. They just have to sit there and tell us, you know, what they're thinking. And that will be more than enough. Yeah. I think the other thing that I pull a lot from cognitive psychology is just the decision-making process in general. So what are the different contexts or, you know, those decision trees, right? When you're meeting someone new for the first time, right? Again, looking at these top-down versus bottom-up processes. I think those are the types of things that, again, when we work interdisciplinarily between different areas of psychology, and I would argue even outside of psychology, I have some great sociology collaborators who make me think about identity in ways that I would never consider, even as a psychologist. Um, but I think the decision-making process is really something, again, regardless of what you may study, we're all thinking about how we choose to cross the street or not, or how we choose to think that person is someone we want to date or someone we want to hate. And so those decision things, I think, are a real strength from cognitive work. I agree with all of that. I get so many of my ideas from cognitive psychology and social cognition has become a field that's been so generative because it's been borrowing from cognitive psychology. The only thing is that um, it's, it's hard to stay updated on the, the current cognitive psychology for social psychologists. And that's why good collaborators are so important to us. And that's why I was so thrilled to be um, having a chance to, to talk to psychonomics because um, I'm thrilled that there's this in We lost you at the end there, David, but um, we can go on to the next question. Um, okay, sure. We, we have a good broad question that came in from Jeremy. What does the field need structurally to make progress here? Are there funding issues, scientific society issues, journal issues, et cetera? I could start with that. There was a great paper that was recently published by Stephen Roberts at Stanford University and his colleagues in Perspectives in Psychological Science. That's really a nice overview of psychology research across cognitive, social, and developmental across the last 50 years or so. And what they show in that paper is that studies sort of focusing on race or aspects of race are increasing slightly in developmental and social psychology, but there's been really no traction at all in cognitive work at all. Um, and so some suggestions that they highlight in that paper is A, to think more about the process of who it is that are reviewing articles about race in the first place, making sure that there's representation both racially and ethnically and gender um, within our editorial boards, our reviewing positions, and then making sure that if you are doing a study about race, you yourself are finding those collaborators to make sure you're doing a good job to actually define how it is that minority experience may or may not be. Um, one error that they sort of saw a lot in some of the work they reviewed was that people would make wrongful assumptions about what they thought a finding might mean for a given group that might be underrepresented or understudied. Um, so I think those are some of the tangible things we can do as a field to start to value this diversity work, both through our leadership but then also valuing the psychologists who are actually recruiting these underrepresented groups in the first place, rather than simply glorifying these large, huge sample sizes that end up being predominantly white. Um, I was saying to the panel before we got going that in preparing for this talk, uh, I was reminded of something my cognitive psychology professor, Neil Johnson, uh, had taught me. Uh, he said that when he used to go as a graduate student to conferences, that people would gather in quadrants in the room. The behaviorists would sit together and then the psychoanalysts and then the gestaltists and then the humanists and a mixture of everybody else who didn't belong. Um, and that eventually that got replaced. There are no schools of psychology as they used to be only a few decades uh, ago. Instead, we have areas of psychology. We say I'm studying social things or I'm studying cognitive things or I'm studying clinical things or developmental things. Um, I'm feeling increasingly disappointed with that way of organizing our field. And you can see that everybody is because we're coming up with fields that have lots of hyphens in them. Social, affective, cognitive, neuroscience. Okay, you tell me what that is, okay? So it's all, it's psychology. And so if that's happening, 
then I think in answer to Jeremy's question, we need to maybe play some leadership role in saying it's terribly odd that if you study something with dots and patterns, you are a cognitive psychologist, but you're studying the same thing with social groups, perception, you're in a different area. We should be, those who are interested in perception uh, should be in some space together, right? And those who are studying memory maybe, and even those, perception and memory are gonna uh, get, get, get linked up as the implicit memory work made so clear that the distinctions between perception and memory itself were kind of fake. And we have to do that for pedagogical purposes, for research purposes, but I think we're upon a moment when some, something, has to, something has to happen. We no longer even require graduate students to come to our program in an area. They just have to mention the names of any two people. So I think it's, it's gonna collapse. And the question is, can we help it collapse quickly and well? And what's the new thing it should re be replaced with? All right, at this point, I'll wrap up the symposium by um, highlighting a couple of ongoing events and initiatives. Uh, so first, uh, you can continue the conversation on these topics at the town hall on the topic of racism in the field of cognition, Sunday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. That's going to be followed immediately by diversity and inclusion virtual networking reception from approximately 3 to 4 on Sunday. And in addition, please consider submitting manuscripts or I'll watch for those forthcoming publications that will appear in a series on systemic racism, cognitive consequences and interventions that's in progress in the journal Cognitive Research Principles and Implications or Creepy. So those things are coming up still. Yes, that's the nickname. <laughs> um, but I wanna thank you all for attending today and bringing such great questions and especially for the speakers for sharing your work and joining us today. Thank you so much.